Now, the very first time Anstiora fought as a unit, right, was at one of the great wars of Aitenfeld against somebody in the West, you know, it was like, they changed the names, it's been Bureau Creek, it's been, you know, whatever it's been, and this was a long time ago, and we ended up with 19, 19 Anstiorans showing up there, 19 seems to be our favorite number, <laughs> and we had the Prince, and we had, and Jan Orzadov was the war captain, and so this was the first time we had ever worn our gold and black. And in those days, the heart on it was over the heart, right? Now you have the, you know, the star was over the heart. Now you have it all over here. That way, because we've gotten blind. <laughs> and um, so they put Unstiora in the middle. They put the Outlands, I think, on the left side, and they put the forces of Aitenveld on the right side, right? and we were in the middle, with our little yellow line. And um, wave after wave came at us, and the forces of the Outlands crumbled and fell away, and the forces of Aitenveld crumbled and fell away. And so all was left was our yellow line on the top of the hill. And we stood there, and as the battle continued, according to those who were there, and I cannot claim it's true because it might be a lie. <laughs> wave after wave came at us. I mean, not one wave, not two waves, but at least four waves came before that was the end of the Onstiorans. All of us lay dead upon the hill. And if there is a song called Farewell to Onstior that is about that battle. Unfortunately, I can't sing, so mm -hmm. you don't get it. So you'll have to get it from someone. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, an interesting thing happened about this time, right? And what happened was, Chorus of Netterhelm won Crown Tournament in Aitenfeld. Now, you wouldn't say that was a horrible thing, but apparently Chorus of Netterhelm took upon himself to wander around and rat a tat on almost everybody's head, because we had a political clique running Aitenfeld at the time. And Sir Tom, the traveler, had attempted to take it on, and Chorus attempted to take it on, and I, I don't remember, uh, I don't think the person after Chorus tried to take it on, but we went, my husband and I, went up to the Crown Tourney in Colorado. Now, while I was sitting there, my husband, I would cook steak for him to feed him protein during the tournament. And so I'm up in the morning wearing my carefully designed, you know, hang around the campsite outfit that flows off of one shoulder, you know. I, I'm sorry, I spent hours in the mirror making sure this was right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm over an open flame cooking, you know, because it's period, right? You know, mm -hmm. and I'm humming to myself badly some folk song. And all of us, this gentleman came out from his tent with an Irish uh, canter, you know, the, for his pipes. And he says, well, may I sit with you? And I said, I'd be more than willing. Would you like some oatmeal? <laughs> I'm Scottish, I always serve oatmeal. <laughs> yeah. If you came to my campsite, you got oatmeal, you know. And one of the ladies I'd met that was a queen and a countess, she, she ended up making oatmeal for us. And 
at her first event, she's going, I'm making oatmeal for Duchess Willow. I'm I'm making oatmeal. But she said this was one of her most real, uh, you know, historically accurate moments in her life, you know. I'm going, oatmeal is your magic moment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to argue the point. Okay, so anyway, this piper comes out, and he sings, he pipes, he's really good. His name is Daniel of Lincolnshire, you know, and he's very, very, very good piper. And I asked him sweetly, hey, would you be willing to, would you be willing to play for my husband during Crown Tourney? Because I want to give him the piper song as my favorite. And of course he goes, I would love that, right? And so we go out and he has, now everybody from the north of Anstior has come with us up to Colorado. So we have on one side of the list view, the crown and all the regular people that come to, you know, and on the other side of the list field, filled from one end to another is a whole group of exceptionally rowdy people. And they're singing and they're dancing and they're singing again. And, you know, they're doing all of this stuff, having a wonderful time supporting Jonathan Deloby's son. And, of course, they're doing that. Jonathan, Jonathan, you know, anything they can think of. And uh, so Jonathan goes out to the sound of the piper and uh, he wins his first battle, right? And he comes back. And during those days, Jonathan would sit in the resting warrior pose and have people sing to him. And his favorite song was The Rocky Road to Dublin, which was sung by Finn Kelly. So his second one, of course, is The Minstrel Boy, which was sung by Damon. And so he would sit there and asked Fingeli to sing Rocky Road to Dublin over, over, over again. And then when he needed a rest, we do Men of Harlech and the Minstrel Boys. But this calmed him. He said meditation made him ready to kill. And so he meditated. He also wasted no energy whatsoever between the rain, you know, rounds which we've also discovered is a way of successfully winning, you know, or if you waste too much energy, a way of predicting that someone will lose, right? Because part of any major tournament is, is uh, uh, endurance, you know. So anyway, he went out, and he went out, and he won, and the piper's getting more and more excited, you know. <coughs> You know, he puts on more good clothes. You know, he changes like every... So now he's fully dressed as a piper. And he's piping and the things are swirling. And the people are dancing. And we come to the finals. Right? And Heinrich, they're moving. This was a gigantic list field. And the two of them moved from one side to the other. And back, it was very exciting. You know... I mean, it wasn't one of those, you know, close in. It was like they went everywhere and quack, 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 quack. You know, the sound was everywhere. It felt like a fight. We're all, I'm sitting there going, please don't let his garment, his clothes I made fall down and keep making get killed. That was my major thing. Every time. <laughs> God, we're going to have a wardrobe failure, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know I should be thinking more elevated thoughts, but that's what came through my mind. And we down with Heinrich, and they, you know, Jonathan took one, this was three, uh, two, you know, the three rounds, and Heinrich took the other one. And now we're to the last one. And you can sell by the Jonathan's shoulders that he is exhausted. So he falls into perfect stands. He's there. He has his shield. He has his sword. Right? Heinrich can see that Jonathan is exhausted. 
He comes forward thinking it will be an easy kill. And on its own, Jonathan's arm went back. <laughs> and he looked at his arm like, who do you belong to? <laughs> <laughs> and the crowd goes wild, I, you know. I, we, we throw daggers into the ground and start dancing around the daggers. We have screaming, <coughs> yelling, and there's a small difference because the king and queen of Aitenfeld are on their way to come and congratulate him. And they get halfway around the circle and we go wild and we're doing all these things. They just turn around and walk back to the other side. <laughs> and in those days, um, Aitenveld was basically controlled by a, a, a power elite that was run by the officers. And um, the officers got really irritated. So Ermansoft, the art and the science officer, Van Deaton of the Titans, who was the Earl Marshal at the time, decided that we couldn't have singing around the list for anymore. <laughs> and they issued a proclamation. And they didn't issue it during the crown before us, which is Johan and Melinda. No, they issued it during Jonathan's reign. I mean, it was a proclamation you know, put in the, you know, the Aiden, whatever it was called. And Jonathan, remember the guy that reads the Kippura, said that that's not legal. <laughs> and went after them and successfully broke the power unit of, you know, and for years later people would go, oh, you're the crown that broke the power unit. You know, it, it, they don't do it anymore because it's been more than 20 years. But that was what we were known for. For many many years. Oh, I have it. I'm sure it added to the comedy. Now, um, we had a little problem when we were the crown. We were at coronation, and all at once, members of the Bentwood Abbey, and we got coronated in Namron, Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma, and a member of the Bentwood Abbey came down and said, "You're not really king." And Jonathan looked at him and said, what do you mean I'm not really king? He says, it's not legal until you stand on the stone of Aitenfeld. Mm -hmm. Now, the stone of Aitenfeld was a big, large rock they had stolen from some park in Arizona. It weighed about 125 pounds, you know, and it was reddish, brownish, right? And people have been standing on it for a while now. You know, but I, we are the only the 18th crown, so we're not really that long into our history. And so, Jonathan thinks, now he has a special weapon, because our foster daughter went up and entranced the, a gentleman who won the Principality of the Outlands coronet. And her, when she got married to her husband, as part of her bride pies, my husband managed to elicit a certain amount of uh, obligational duties. So he called up his daughter and he said, get me the stone of baby help. You know. And they thought about it, they thought about it, they didn't quite know how they can do it because it was in somebody's mundane house. But it happened to be that they met the person's wife and said, you any way we can get the stone of Aitenfeld? And she said, yes, I can get it for you, you know. So she went in and got the stone and gave it to my the princess of the Outlands, who carried it down to Norman, Oklahoma, who gave it to his grace, now his majesty, who took the stone all the way down to San Antonio, which is Bjornsburg, to an event. Now, at the event, of course, he stood upon the stone and proclaimed himself King of Aitenfeld. 
he let me stand on the stone too, so I got to betray myself queen for the example. Now the Prince of Anstiora wanted to stand on the stone, and Jonathan knocked him off. <laughs> so we leave, leaving the stone in the keeping of the vicar of, of uh, Bjornsberg, Torgatai the Black Wolf, my first husband, right? But that's okay, we have a friendship, but he has the stone. And we go back up, right? And the Bentwood Abbey is exceptionally upset that we have stolen their stone. And they ask for it back. And Jonathan says, it's property of Aitenfeld. If it's a sacred stone of Aitenfeld, you can claim it. It is, belongs to the kingdom. And they weren't happy about that. So we went up to Aiton Warlord, and here they come out with black candles, and they excommunicated us. <laughs> and of course, Guvald, Master Guvald, who uh, was having fits because they put out the candles on the beautiful church floors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, he, you know, he's, he's going, but we are now excommunicated from the Bentwood Abbey, which was some weird religion. It's a Zuid, Druid, Zen Druids, I think, you know. But we don't know what to do about it. So the head of the uh, heralds comes up and said, because you are excommunicated, and anyone that serves you will be excommunicated to, right? All the heralds are going on strike. And Jonathan looks, he said, thank you very much. There is no problem. Turns to his knights and say, you will now be heralds. <laughs> Which worked just fine. We didn't have any trouble, right? And during the feast, every course was served by another group of nobles. So by the time we'd gotten finished with this feast, except for the heralds, everybody else had been excommunicated. <laughs> Now, that's fine. We go down to an event in Austin, which is uh, Bringalot. Now we go down there, and the United Asoteric Church of Onsteora is in flame that we had been excommunicated. So they come out and excommunicate the Bentwood Abbey. <laughs> Now during this time, one of the things we got in trouble with over the years is we went to um, do a no negotiate the first uh, war we had between, you know, in the middle. I mean, it was Calendar basically, but it was the middle versus, uh, you know. And we go up there, and after we <laughs> were given dinner, Jonathan announced that we had been excommunicated. <laughs> and everybody had fits because they had served us during the dinner or had been in return. And so they were very irritated because we had managed to get them to be excommunicated. You know, and, and so we, they did not think our joke was funny. <laughs> so we go back down and now we learn a horrible truth. Right. Bentwood Abbey is not only Bentwood Abbey, it's actually a religious outside the SDA group. And their stone is one of their sacred, sacred things. <laughs> and they're now exceptionally upset because they want their stone back. So Jonathan thought about it. And he put the stone in the back of this car. Well, first we had to go down to Bjornsburg. And Torgatai had left the stone in his house, front yard, when he had moved. So Torgatai had to steal the stone out of somebody's front yard. And then we had it <laughs> taken up to Norman, which is, you know, a five hour trip. Jonathan put it in his trunk and carried it up all the way to uh, up to the outlands 
and he left it in the front yard of Alfred, the Seneschal. And mysteriously, the stone disappeared. But the thing that Jonathan, as king, said is that he ever saw that stone again, right? There would be no stone after that. <laughs> and so, when it got to Bentwood Abbey, a miracle occurred. The stone rose itself up through its shroud, and from then on, the kings of Aitenveld stood under the shroud of the stone of Aitenveld to be made king. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs>